I'm Savati Shah. I'm a cardiologist at Duke University and former chair of the American Heart Association Genomic and Precision Medicine Committee and chair of the American Heart Association Research Committee. Genetic technologies are rapidly advancing. This has really expanded the use of exome and genome sequencing in diagnostics, in research, and by consumers. And this has led to incidental identification of genetic variants that are important to cardiovascular disease. Well, what does that mean? It's really genetic variants that are found in cardiovascular disease associated genes, but that there isn't a concern at the time of testing that the individual had such a disease. Several large research studies have found a relatively high burden of these incidental variants which are sometimes also called secondary variants when they do large cardiovascular disease studies. And more clinicians are finding these variants as they do more diagnostic exome and genome sequencing. And all of this has really led to a challenge for both clinicians and scientists alike. What does one do when one finds an incidental variant in a cardiovascular disease gene? I'm joined today by Drs. Andrew Landstrom and Anwar Chahal, who led the writing group which drafted consensus-based guideline for interpreting incidental variants. This scientific statement, published in the spring of 2023, describes a framework through which clinicians and scientists can assess the pathogenicity of an incidental variant, clinically evaluate the patient and importantly also their family, and provide ongoing support as part of a multidisciplinary care team. Anwar, Andrew, it's great talking to you today. Well, Thanks for having us. So if I'm a busy clinician, what, why should I care about this statement? What's really important about this statement? So I think as you nicely opened in the introduction, uh, this statement really captures a, a growing problem in the field. As genetics and genomics has become increasingly available to researchers and clinicians, we're finding things that we didn't expect to find, these incidentally identified variants. And it's a problem. So if you're stuck with a research team and you're finding these variants, and current guidance says <clears throat> they may be associated with disease, you should tell the research participants, that's a big problem. If you're a clinician and you're sitting in clinic with a patient who found a Identified, incidentally identified variant by exome sequencing, and you're left trying to figure out, is that something I should be worried about, this family should be worried about, that's a problem. And so this statement is one tool to try to unify thinking about how to interpret these variants and how a busy clinician or a busy researcher might actually move forward with them. Yeah, it's an incredibly complex topic, and again, really important not just for researchers, but as you nicely said, important for clinicians, because they're going to be dealing with this more and more over the next few years. Anwar, what sorts of things should researchers and clinicians keep in mind with exome and genome sequencing to make sure that they're thinking about these incidental findings and that they're at the front of their minds? So, uh, you know, as Andrew pointed out, a lot of these things um, turn up when you weren't actually looking for them. And the problem here really lies in, does this have a large effect size? Does it impact your patient? What's the penetrance of it? And the worst thing that can happen with these genes are people could drop dead. And that's what people are really worried about at the back. The number one thing, do I have a patient that I'm going to lose who's going to drop dead suddenly and unexpectedly? But there are other pieces to that. Do they develop heart failure, atrial fibrillation, stroke, all those other consequences, sequelae of having Mendelian cardiovascular disease. And there's also a list of genes. ACMG has put together a list. At the time, they were 81. They've just updated it to 83 and over 15% of those are cardiovascular. The rest tend to be the oncology genes. So that's a big problem, and if you look at that, it includes those uh, usual culprits, the titan, the dilated cardiomyopathy, the long QT, uh, KCM genes, and the CM5As, but you worry about how that impacts it. So the way we, we really thought about this, this was in part driven by researchers having to deal with things in their own biobanks or their own uh, smaller studies where they identify if they're looking for a candidate gene that's close to a cardiovascular gene and it comes up, but also for when they deliberately looked for that later after the biobank was developed. Um, and then they don't know what to do and they contact the clinicians and clinicians are like, what do I do with this? 
And that was the idea. So think about it broadly in terms of the dyslipidemias, the cardiomyopathies, the ion channel disease, and the aortopathies, and then how those can impact people. And what we thought here was, you know, you have to think, what is sensible? We don't need to over-test people. We don't want to worry people unnecessarily, and we don't want to burden patients, clini clinics, clinicians, uh, payers. We all have to be fiscally responsible, especially in this climate, by just over-testing with all of that. But they're the four uh, main domains that we thought are relevant. That's great, and it's so important because this balance is really tough. We know that there's lots of undiagnosed monogenic cardiovascular disease, so identifying these incidental variants, as you say, isn't just about risk, but could actually identify patients who are, you know, could, as you say, um, have a significant uh, cardiovascular event and may actually have the disease and it's just not recognized. So that balance is really tough. Thank indeed, you. Indeed. Andrew. What sorts of variants are most often flagged, and why are some reported while others are not? So as, as Anwar mentioned, um, there are particular guidances that are in place from the American College of Medical Genetics that suggest that certain variants in certain genes should be reported back. And this can be in the research setting, or it could be in an exome or a genome setting conducted in, in the clinical arena. And so predominantly, these are variants that are being reported back or being discussed as being things that might need to be returned back to the individual who was sequenced. This list is not inclusive, and uh, the, the benefit of, of oftentimes this kind of genetic testing is there's lots of knowledge, specialized knowledge among the individuals who are doing the gene testing, and so this, le this list may grow depending on the perspective of the research team or the clinical team. Um, but as Anwar mentioned, that this actually creates the complexity that we see because there is no set guidance for what to do with those variants for how to actually interpret them, whether they're on that ACMG list or not. Um, and what do you do when you're, when you're stuck with the findings? Oh, and yeah, I think the, the principles that, that Anwar mentioned are all 100% uh, front of mind in our thinking when we drafted these guidances. We wanted to make sure they were approachable, uh, sort of a, 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 an accessible way for clinicians and researchers to think about these variants. And it, and it basically boils down to planning ahead. So before you get that clinical exome, before you get that research-based exome, have you considered the, the possibility of finding an incidentally identified variant? How have you built that into your thinking, your, your research pipeline? And those questions about what kind of variants will you report back, what kinds of gene variants will you report back, should then start to kind of percolate in the discussion if you're having that plan. And we found that oftentimes people uh, can gain a lot of traction when you have the variants, if you've anticipated what those possible things could be before you ever got the gene test. So one aspect of this I think is critically important. Very well said, and I think also all, you know, bringing the participant or the patient into that conversation too so that they understand what might happen downstream and whether they want to receive any of those results, especially on the research side. So yeah, thank you, Andrew. So Anwar, I think this statement has a lot of really important details about what to do if, a, if an incidental cardiovascular variant is identified. Can you kind of give us a little bit of a framework of how you think about this across those four categories uh, that, are, that are covered under monogenic cardiovascular diseases? Sure, so uh, and I think as you both touched on there, you have to look at what's return of results included. And that's the first critical step. So if you're looking at, let's say, UK biobank internal results is not part of that, so actually your conversation ends. We briefly touch on, you know, good regulatory practices are to have that laid out. And really there should be some form of a committee at your own organisation that does that. Uh, the IRB may not necessarily be the right group to, to say that because they may not be experienced at genetics, but ultimately they will have to decide that bit. So that's the first step. Are you allowed? What's your return of results pathway? And follow that. And then when you identify that and you see that that yes is correct, we have said focused on those that are pathogenic or likely pathogenic. We have not taken the other VUS and benign likely benign you don't have to act on um, into consideration. We've caveated that because as you know, VUSs are not all benign. It was a long time ago we we got very excited that we we're all going to be pathogenic and we were wrong, but it's gone the other way now. People just assume VUSs don't mean anything. And that would also be equally unwise so we caveat that with, if you look at the new, uh, and it's a bit of a spoiler alert, but the ACMG are updating their 2015 variant classification guideline. 
that's coming out very, very soon. It actually says, for this sort of thing, don't look at the BUS, look at the PULP, which makes our lives easier. So if it's pathogenic or likely pathogenic, then what do you do? You refer to a cardiologist with the expertise in this. I mean, that's the critical piece here. I don't think it's fair um, for them to go to people who aren't dealing with this. My wife's a primary care physician. She has patients come in who've got their recreational genetic testing done, and they come in and they say, what do I do with this? And she said, I have no idea, go see my husband. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, that's simply, I think clinicians are worried about what to do with this. So we would say find the expert um, and ask them. This is another really important bit. This is really an evidence-free zone. What we're doing is so cutting edge. We don't have robust data to support what we're saying. So the experts in the, in the writing group have come together with something that's principle-based to say, look, if they turn up, this is what we understand about the condition right now. These are, we think, are sensible screening tools to introduce. So for example, if you had someone with a cardiomyopathy, a history, physical examination, 12 lead ECG, and an echo are not unreasonable to start with. You don't need to jump on MRI and CT pen and all the rest of it at this stage. Then, let's say, for example, we did that with those tests, counsel on the family aspects, because if they carry it, they've got children or siblings or parents who are alive, you don't know if that's a de novo uh, varying. You need to assume that it's not until proven otherwise. So that's what we also then recommend. Going back to your question with the aortopathies, we go by symptoms. We're not going to put everyone through a CT uh, uh, aortograph. <laughs> that's just, we think, unnecessary, a lot of radiation. But start with evaluating them a good history. Do they smoke? Are they going to attempt safe? Do they have bad custody valves? That sort of thing is to, to ask about that before saying, OK, maybe we would proceed with some additional uh, baseline tests to go with that. With ion channel disease, fortunately, 12 lead ECG, perhaps some form of ambulatory ECG monitoring, 24-hour volta would not be unreasonable. Or just start with a 12 lead and see for the symptoms and then proceed ahead with that. And then for the dyslipidemias, which in some ways are easier, it should really be done as a part of well-man, well-woman screening to actually check what are your you know, ASCVD risk factors uh, that could then be included there. So that's how we sort of broadly laid that out. And then there's a little bit of you know, clinician expert discretion. Sometimes it may be, let's say it's a DSP. We know DSP has lots of inflammation as part of that. And you may say, you know what, we know the ESC is just published on this this new category of non-dilated left ventricular cardiomyopathy, which Pinto was call, calling gene positive, uh, um, isolated, hypokinetic or non-dilated or dilated and uh, preserved ejection fraction. Essentially, we know that we're seeing these early phenotypes. So discretion there that if you saw a DSP, you know the EF might not be affected. You might need the MRI to show you the scar. That's great. I think it's really helpful for clinicians to have this framework, even if we don't have the evidence base. And as we increase the use of uh, both incidental findings and primary genetic testing, I think we'll have a large number of carriers that will be able to create the evidence base to figure out what is the right way to screen these people. And these variants of uncertain significance, these VUSs, uh, we're sort of lucky now as clinicians, we can kind of put those to the side and really focus on these pathogenic, likely pathogenic variants, but as research evolves, those VUSs will understand a little bit better. Absolutely. So Anwar, as a follow-up question, how should a patient with an incidental variant, be? should they be followed long-term, or is this a one-time evaluation that you do? I, I think if it's a pathogenic, likely pathogenic, most of the guidelines or statements out there for people with phenotype actually say that if you identify that gene and another family member carries it, that family member should then be evaluated a little bit more frequently. If there was no gene um, and you, you suspect it's genetic disease, you didn't identify a pathogenic variant, you would evaluate an asymptomatic family member about every two to three years, roughly. But when you have identified a gene, you don't know if it's going to have penetrance in them, and you don't know if the initial manifestation will be sudden death. So therefore, it's not unreasonable to evaluate them once a year or once every two years, uh, depending on the condition, and then, uh, of course, educate your patient to say, contact us, it's down to you. So I always tell them, look, I'm empowering you. We can set the follow-up for 18 months or whatever, but if things change, you need to reach out to us, we want to see you soon. Um, so that's the way we, we really thought about making sure that the long-term evaluation goes on. Now, for family members, when we test them, 
and we identify they don't carry the gene, it's going to be they're you know, they're happy patients. Really important to think about the family too. We're not just talking about the person Absolutely. who has the incidental variant, it affects the family members too. Absolutely. Andrew, what should a research participant or a patient know if their clinician or their research study is about to embark on exome or genome sequencing? What's important for them to know? I think it's the outstanding question because I think a lot of this can actually be just as, you know, Anwar empowers his patients in the clinic, I think empowering patients, individuals who are participating in research is actually central to this process and increasing both their awareness of things like incidental variants as well as what kind of conversations they should have so that they feel there's a plan in place. And I think it basically boils down to a, a few concepts for them. You know, the first is to, like anything else, know what you're getting into. You know, have they explained the study? What's the goal of the study? How does the sequencing fall into that? And then what's the plan? And that could be something very general, like what's the plan for my sequencing overall? How are they going to use it for their research study? That's just good research participation 101. But then more specific questions about, well, what if you do find something? How might it impact my care? How might it trigger an evaluation like the ones that Anwar was talking about? And potentially, to your point, uh, Svadi, like how might it impact my family? And I think if I could wave a magic wand and make the perfect future out of all of this, it would be one where the families, the research subjects, before they undergo that testing, they feel empowered to ask those questions on the team. Because I think what they'll find is that when they have that tough conversation up front and everyone's on the same page, then they're able to provide true informed consent, or in the case of kids, informed assent that they want to participate. And the goal of the study or the goal of the clinical testing can be achieved while these you know, problematic areas like incidental variants can actually be anticipated in advance. Um, that it shouldn't be a barrier for good research. It shouldn't be a barrier for good diagnostic exome clinical care. And I think if the families and the patients and the research participants keep it in their front of mind, then I think everyone can get the testing done that they need and everyone's made aware. Very well said, and even having the option to say, I don't want my retur results returned to me, you know, if you're in a research study. But I, th I think, you know, having the patient, the participant at the center of that conversation is so important. Anwar, really, this statement is really fantastic. You both did a great job on it, and it was fun to work with you. How does this statement advance our hopes and dreams around a precision based approach to how we take care of cardiovascular patients? Now you've got me excited with the dream and what we could actually deliver. And sometimes I find it hard to uh, contain my enthusiasm. We touched on this a little bit earlier with you know, some of this. It's evidence-free as a zone. But what we're developing now is really going to guide what's going to happen in the future. And we've always been troubled. You know, whenever you've had a patient who's had an out of hospital arrest or not survived uh, a cardiac arrest, it's always troubled you. Could we have picked it up? And especially when the patient's younger, it becomes a very emotive subject. We've had some of these recent um, sports stars who've arrested on the field, and it gets the public talking. And when, when we lose family members who are much older, it's sad. But if they're sort of 90s, or 100, we'd all say, you know, they had a good shot at life. But when they're younger, we think of the potential years of life. And then all those hopes, aspirations, and dreams could we be at one point where we're able to just screen people at birth? I mean, I'm jumping, I'm doing the Star Trek thing now, but I'm sort of thinking, you know, where does this go in the future? I think it's gonna happen um, maybe 10, 20 years from now, where we're just gonna start doing screening for everybody at birth. Some centers already started to do this. There are efforts uh, across the world, as some leading organizations to do neonatal um, genetic screening. That is sometimes a targeted panel, but certain places are introducing people in some whole genome. The clever way to sort of handle that is certainly what we're doing. We, we brought in precision health, and if I can um, say that that's the preventative arm of precision medicine, because we're offering whole exome sequencing the acapicrete to participants at no cost on a whole genome backup. And what we're saying is we're going to look for CDC tier 1 condition, FH, breast and ovarian cancer, lip support. CDC are going to add HCN very, very soon, actually. January last year, they had a presentation on it. They've just not decided which genes to include. So HCN is going to come. This is not a rare disease. It's one in 500 for sarcomeric HCN. Um, if you now 
add all that up and say, right, if we do that for individuals and we can offer genetic screening, how do we take that to the next level? The next natural step to that would be pharmacogenomics. We all have patients, give them class three uh, antiarrhythmic medications, and we, we uh, see these problems that go on. Um, we don't want patients having torso arms. Uh, what if you knew before you actually gave the drug that they were gonna get QT prolongation? Now you're getting into precision medicine, uh, applied to a pharmacogenomics field, which has great potential for us. So one of the models might be, for example, we've done this genetic passport that lives in the cloud. And if you're now gonna give the drug, rather than querying all the long QT genes immediately and creating a problem for yourselves, if the US is brought to deal with, is it when you give it, you query the data now with your script and it can take only 10 minutes. That, I think, is the future. And I think that's really cool with where you know, this could go. The work we're all doing with our, our biobanks and biorepositories and data that we're generating is gonna inform us where's the sweet spot here? Where do we get it just right to really deliver on, uh, you know, the right drug, the right dose, right time to the right patient with the intended effects and not the side effects? That's, I think, where the future is. That's great. So we're gonna sequence when uh, a baby is born and then re-query that sequence so we don't have to sequence again. It's a great, it's a great future to think about. Both my children have a, a rare genetic disease, and so to think that I could have avoided um, them their diagnostic odyssey, I think it's a, it's a great vision and getting closer you know, each year to that vision. I think we really highlighted the importance of these incidental or secondary variants and how they may actually be able to help patients, but they really have to be thought of very carefully and we have to make sure that our patients and research participants understand what these potential incidental variants might mean. The future for precision medicine is, is really bright and um, we're getting closer and closer to the vision where we can really use genetics on an iterative basis to improve the care, not only of patients with cardiovascular diseases, but with all diseases. So thank you Anwar and Andrew for being with me today and talking about this really important statement. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us.